Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today, sometimes you're a toaster, sometimes you're the co toaster. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Seth Nelson. As always, I'm here with my good friend, Pete Wright. Happy holidays, Seth Nelson. Happy holidays. Yeah, feeling good. Feeling good. Let me tell you my favorite thing about the holidays. Tell me. When I get emergency phone calls <laughs> on Christmas Eve. Love those. Yeah. Where, who, who's the one who's usually calling you on Christmas Eve, those emergency calls? It's always parents. Yeah. Arguing about pick up, drop off, what's going on. And first off, it's not going to be emergency by the court. Yeah, the court, because the court is there in Puerto Vallarta, right? They're <laughs> yeah. having an actual holiday. Exactly. Now, you might not know this about the court system, but there is something called a duty judge. That's like an RA on duty over the holidays? You got it. The one who keeps the heat running? There's always a judge on duty. Okay. So, and that will be for search warrants. It will be for emergency motions that are filed. There's always a duty judge. And so what will happen is on Christmas Eve, someone will call somebody about something and some lawyer will file an emergency motion, which in Hillsborough County will be met with what's called an emergency motion handling order, which is the judge just saying, the duty judge saying, is this an emergency? If so, I'm going to deal with it right now and I'm going to do an order or is it not an emergency or and just set it in the normal course of business. We've talked about this. Get with your regular assigned judge. Get some hearing dates, clear the hearing dates with opposing counsel, go on and on and on. And it goes from there. But let's say it's Christmas Eve and you get a lawyer on the phone and he files an emergency motion and the judge grants it. Okay. You got a piece of paper saying that you're right, you're supposed to go get the kids. Unless they, in that order, it says the sheriff is supposed to go with you. I don't think it's going to matter much. So you're, you're standing on the front lawn with this piece of paper and no support. Most likely. Right. Dodging the reindeer. So this is this seems like a recipe, first of all, for a nightmare situation, which is uh, to me uh, sounds like the holidays are already a ripe place to pick a fight. I mean, it, it, that's the stereotype, right? We're already going to fight because families are coming together over the holidays trying to figure stuff out and they're not even divorcing one another. So now you have this, this you, you have to figure out how to co-parent and are likely going to not get the support you f may feel you deserve or merit from the court. So that let's just to be really clear, I don't know what I'm talking about, but you both are obviously in the system and you have co-parented during the holidays after a divorce. So I, I need you to tell me the basics now, now that we've set the table with all of the the nonsense that could happen with the court, which all I'm thinking about right now is is Judge Harry Stone from the most famous courtroom I ever knew. Night Court. Night Court. There you go. Love that show. Right? <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, and, and you know, what are you going to do to make good co-parenting decisions that support the kids, support the family in the state that it is as it's, you know, splitting up? Where do you, where do you start to get your head right around this stuff? Well, the first thing I would suggest is tell you what not to do. Okay. As opposed to telling you what to do. And my not to do column is to prevent problems. And so when you're working on a parenting plan, do not have an exchange day on the same day that you're traveling. Oh, okay. All right. And what I mean by that is we all know the busiest traveling day of the year is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So if I have Thanksgiving this year, one way to do that is to say, I get the children at 9 o'clock a.m. on Thanksgiving morning. Makes it a little hard to catch my 1 o'clock flight if the other parent's late or doesn't have the kids ready or there's a problem with the exchange. Mm -hmm. So try your best not to exchange the children on a day that you're traveling. So how do you prevent that? When you do a parenting plan, you can define by agreement when the holiday starts and stops, because we have Thanksgiving break, but then we have Thanksgiving day. So we just say for Thanksgiving break, the 
regular schedule shall control until Tuesday at 6 p.m. And at Tuesday at 6 p.m., dad gets the, the children for the remainder of Thanksgiving break in odd number years. And the mom gets in even number years. And this is just my hypothetical. So why do I do it Tuesday at 6 p.m.? Because then you have the option to travel on Wednesday because it's fun doing that, the busiest travel day of the year. Mm -hmm. But at least you're picking up the children the night before. You're packing them. You're getting them ready. You're making sure they have everything they need. If they, you get them at 6 and you realize at 8 that they forgot their blanket at dad's you can so or at mom's, you can solve that problem by going to get the blanket. Yeah, you have you have a window. You do that exchange nine o'clock and you've got a one o'clock flight and you're on the way to the airport and you forgot the blanket, that blanket's not coming with you. Right, right. But but a lot of trauma. A lot of drama with a kid screaming in, in the back. Yeah. Right. 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 What is the what is the sense like I mean, a, a lot of these I don't know, I'm I'm gonna speak globally, but I it's not fair, I'm sure. But uh, uh, a lot of kids have the whole week off, right, of Thanksgiving? Like, is there any sense of just saying when vacation starts, you pick a place? Yeah. So what happens a lot is is there's different ways to divide up holidays. And we had that whole podcast that we did about just holidays. But just as a refresher for people, you can divide the whole break. You can just say mom gets even years the entire break, dad gets odd years, and it just flips back and forth. Or, and this would happen a lot, or you can divide hey, let's keep the regular schedule for a certain amount of the holiday break, like I just described in my hypothetical, but then we're going to define it the rest of the way. Or take winter break, and we're going to talk about Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So mom gets the first half in odd number of years, dad gets the first half in even number in even number of years, and the other parent gets the other half. But they want to split Christmas Day. Okay. A lot of families want to do this. I try to prevent problems. So I'm always telling people, you want your kid to enjoy Christmas and not go back and forth. So I advise not to do it because it opens the door for conflict on Christmas Day. Now, remember, if you're in town and you want to do it, you can always do it, even if the parenting plan says otherwise. But a lot of people say, no, I want to see my kid on Christmas Day. So here's my suggestion on Christmas Day. First off, Whoever has Christmas Eve is obviously going to have Christmas morning. But do the exchange in the afternoon, like around two o'clock, because you don't want your kid waking up, opening up their gifts, and then having to leave at 10 a.m. Right. They don't get to enjoy Christmas morning and sitting around in the funny pajamas that we all get and, and playing with their new toys. So then the parent that gets them at two o'clock keeps them overnight till the next day at two o'clock or they just keep them for the remainder of the holiday. But remember, whoever gets the first half will have Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Whoever gets the second half of winter break is going to have New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Oh, OK. All right. Yeah, you get a little holiday hopscotch. So you get a little it, holiday, right? It's a little ex exchange. It, it brings up the the question of, you know, we're looking for for reasons where escalation might occur, occur, it seems to bring up things around like specific familial ceremonies and mealtime that tends to be very important for folks. And, you know, generally, are you are you doing um, a Christmas Eve dinner or Christmas morning or Christmas Christmas Day afternoon, early dinner? Like how how that happens? If there's a reason to fight, it's going to be you brought me my my kid full and they're not participating in the in the in our mealtime tradition happens all the time and that's one of the reasons why you don't split the day because your kid has to sit nicely at the table twice not just once right and they're not eating at one or they ate too much or now their stomach hurts there's all these problems that arise not to mention that in the middle of the day you know they're having fun with they're having fun with their cousins and then they got to leave so, and, and remember, nobody cares. The court doesn't care. The lawyers shouldn't care if you decide to do this anyway, even though your parenting plan says you have the full day. So you can always make agreements, be flexible with the plan. So that's just where my default is. I know a lot of parents want to see the kids on Christmas Day. So when you're doing that, my suggestion is make it later in the day, have the parent you know, coming to get the child, 
beginning their time sharing, do the pickup because you're going to be on time. The other parent might not be right. If someone's drinking like, Hey, you're not going to drink when you go pick up your kid. But if you're the one dropping off and everyone's having eggnog in the morning and they're going to participate, that could be a problem. So you want to be the one doing the driving. Pete, we're talking about the holidays on this show. Yeah, we are. One of the things, stressful time, we're saying, hey, be calm, focus on your kid. But it is ripe, 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 ripe for people to drink in excess and drink when they should not be drinking. So you really just need to be careful. You really need to be self-aware of what's going on around you and what are your responsibilities when you have those kids. Yeah. You know, it's going to be New Year's Eve, fireworks. We don't want to be drinking when we're playing with sparklers. <laughs> um, there's all sorts of stuff going on. There's, there's, you know, the nice fire is, you know, toasting marshmallows on Christmas Eve potentially and making s'mores. There's all this stuff going on. You've got to be careful when it comes to alcohol. And one of the best ways to do that is, and, and to help de-escalate potentially difficult situations is to have the data and to know that you have a resource that's going to help you understand both your relationship with alcohol if you need it and the relationship of your your co-parent if you need to know that too. And one of those fantastic resources that is a great friend of the show is Soberlink. Uh, Soberlink is uh, a, a device. It's a breathalyzer device. It has facial recognition on it. If you're dealing with alcohol, if you're collecting data about alcohol use for you or your co-parent, you blow into that device. It sends real-time data uh, data about whether or not you are sober, sober enough to drive your kids, sober enough to be around your kids, sober enough to uh, live the life that you want to live uh, in the context of your divorce. That's Soberlink, and they're a huge help. Seth, you use it with your clients. Absolutely. And here's the deal. You're going to say, it's the holidays. I want to have a drink. I'm with my kid. That's fine. But what you're going to get accused of is drinking to excess and your kids aren't safe. And so then what happens is, you're going to get an emotion and you're going to get in front of a judge and there's going to be all these witnesses they're going to call and you're going to have to pay your lawyer all this sort of money to defend you to prove a he said, she said, or what did you do or not do? or And it goes down to credibility. And sometimes the judge won't believe you, not because you're not telling the truth, just because the way you say something didn't sound truthful, even though you're saying the truth. So there's a lot that happens in a courtroom that shouldn't. Judges make mistakes. They get it wrong sometimes. So how do you just get that all out of the way. You have independent third-party real-time verification that says, I wasn't drinking. Judge, you can line up as many people as they want. They can bring all these witnesses, but I've got an independent verification with my face showing that I blew into a breathalyzer on Christmas Eve at nine o'clock and I had not had anything to drink. And you're done. And you're done. Whether you are falsely accused of alcohol use or are concerned about your child's safety because of your co-parent's alcohol use, Soberlink's right there working hard to keep kids safe. This is remote alcohol monitoring system. It is the gold standard because of their great technology. Don't miss Soberlink's free guide for this holiday season. You can request it today at Soberlink.com slash toaster. That's Soberlink.com slash toaster. Thanks to the Soberlink team for sponsoring this show. Gifts. Co-parenting ideas around sane gift giving. Okay. How'd you handle this? So let's start what happens when you're married. Kids are little. Who do they get gifts from? Santa Mm -hmm. and mom and dad. Why does gifts from mom and dad have to stop just because you're divorced? They don't. But parents rarely do that. It's now a gift from mom and at dad's, it's a gift from dad. But sometimes it's nice to have a gift from both parents. Got it. A gift from both parents. It's a joint gift. And there should be a joint gift from mom and dad that's at mom's house. And there could be a joint gift from mom and dad at dad's house. And so some pre-planning and communication helps. By way of example. If you're getting a bicycle, you're going to want the kid to ride the bicycle at both houses. Why not get the same bike? And then it's not a bike from mom or a bike from dad. These two bikes are from mom and dad because kids learn to ride a bike. So 
it could it doesn't have to be a bag. I'm just saying by way of example, there can be small gifts at each house from mom and dad. Because that's a way that you show your kid. You both love her. You both love your kid. You're both giving them a gift. Just as if you were, if you're married, because to that kid, you're still the parents. It doesn't matter that you're not married. Well, and if you if you if we ask the question specifically around escalation and de-escalation, the isn't the trope that you're buying attention by separating the gifts. Mom buys a bunch of gifts, dad buys a bunch of gifts. We're we're looking for, you know, there's some sort of unconscious team upsmanship. Absolutely. It happens all the time. And also there's usually an imbalance of wealth after a divorce, right? Someone's receiving alimony and people are annoyed that they're paying the alimony check or you get your child support check. But a little pre-planning and saying, look, Christmas is coming up. I would like to have some sort of level of gift giving that we can agree upon. Or if you're going to be giving a larger gift, it would be nice if I could, you know, you could put my name on that gift too, even if maybe I don't give 50% of the gift. And like, it's not about the money. It's about that you are focused on your kid. So if I want to give my kid a big gift, let's say they're in middle school and they've been dying for that phone and they're going to get the new iPhone. What's wrong with putting mom's name on that gift? Nothing. Your kid still gets it. Now, if you're looking for the credit, you know, because you want to control that phone and have the power, then get your ego out of the way. Let's focus on the kid. Well, and that gets to, again, opportunities to de-escalate usually start with ego. Right. Right. Like you say, getting it out of the way. I, you know, I like the, 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 the bike discussion because, you know, if you have the means and the resources to have a bike at both places, that, that solves a, a very practical challenge too, which is just, we don't want to lug a bike back and forth. It won't get taken back and forth. One parent's going to keep the bike and the kid goes without bike riding for a week. Yeah, right. Doesn't sound like fun. No, it doesn't sound like a lot of fun, especially in the months right after Christmas when the bike is still new. That's right. All right. We've been talking about sort of presumptively around Thanksgiving and Christmas, but other holiday structures to consider Hanukkah. Um, I, that seems to be more complicated to me. Why? Because there's eight days. <laughs> Just uh... there's so many days, man. I mean, the only benefit is there's they're even, I guess. But yeah, uh... and like which way do you light the candles which... on the menorah? It's right. so confusing. <laughs> okay, so I'm very confused. By so, okay, so here's the deal. It's not that Hanukkah in it of itself is difficult because typically in the Jewish religion, like the first night's the most important, or the second night, and you know we kind of have these things kind of laid out. And those are just traditions, not real religious, saying that one day in Hanukkah is more important than the other. Okay. The real problem comes when... I just like hearing you say, we have it laid out. Like, we of the Jewish faith, we have it like you, but you're on the board, and you just figured it out. I'm going to speak for all of Judaism Would you speak for all of Judaism, (laughs) But I'm only going to do it in Yiddish and Hebrew, (laughs) so no one can understand. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) If, if you understand, you know who you are. <laughs> exactly. And you know that I'll be wrong on what yeah, I'm saying. Right. <laughs> so the problem is when these holidays overlap. First night of Hanukkah happens to be Christmas Eve. So the way you try to really do that in your parenting plan is to understand that, look, what do we do if there's a conflict? Which holiday will prevail on which year? And don't just start arguing about this when you're doing a parenting plan about the what ifs. Because you can Google and say, how often in the next 10 years were Hanukkah and Christmas overlap? Because people will argue about it. And then I'll look on the calendar and I said, it happens once and your kid will be 17. Do we really care? Right, right. So you want to avoid these issues because settling a case is hard enough as it is. It's even harder when you're dealing with what ifs. So always define what you're arguing about. Now, here's the bottom line. Kids don't care. They don't care what day they get gifts. Okay? You can do third night of Hanukkah and treat it like it's first night of Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. The kid will be just as happy. Now, I'll share a story about Kai. Kai, your son. My son. When he was little, four or five years old, think about four, and... Just the way the schedule worked, he was going to be at his mom's for the first five nights of Hanukkah, for whatever reason. And he comes and he's talking to me and he goes, Dad, do you know what's happening on Hanukkah? I said, yeah, we would light menorahs, we sing songs, we have family dinners. 
you know, we make latkes. He's like, no, I'm at mom's for the first five nights. So when I come to you on the sixth night, Am I getting the six gifts because I didn't get the five <laughs> gifts for the days I was at mom? I'm like, nope, that's not how it works. <laughs> There's eight nights of Hanukkah, not 16 nights of Hanukkah. Yeah, right, exactly. I said, but I do appreciate the math. <laughs> yeah, the math and the intention. He is your son after all. Exactly. Like, tell me you didn't, you wouldn't have made the same, dis- the same. I would have made the pitch. same argument. Yeah. <laughs> no, here's the deal, though. The point I'm raising here is don't over gift right don't over gift and having these communications is really important so if you can communicate about what kind of stuff you're getting and hey what am i giving what are you giving you know we don't want to like load the kid up with all the clothes at both houses because we didn't communicate but got no video games and we don't want to give all video games and no uh, something else so a little communication goes a long ways and i would even extend that to the grandparents And other people buying your kid's gift, like, hey, you know, we got the bike covered this year or whatever. So this always comes back to communication. It comes back to thinking this stuff through. It comes back to being proactive and trying to deal with this stuff on the front end, not the back, and and go from there. That message is really important. The idea that you have as co-parents an opportunity to set expectations in advance, even with your young children. You you can you can make a story that actually is believable and loving and heartwarming that helps them navigate complicated holiday splits too. But to your point, there's other holidays. There's spring break. There's birthdays, Easter, Passover. Um, There's all sorts of different holidays. All these same suggestions that I'm giving all apply. For example, Mother's Day. We don't really necessarily think of that as a holiday. It's on a Sunday. But what happens there is I would do the exchange on Saturday night at six o'clock. And then you drop the kid off at school on the following Monday. Why do I do that? Because if it's dad's weekend and mom has Mother's Day from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., hey, the problem there is you're going to see your ex-spouse twice on that day. Yeah. And your kid doesn't get to get up early, make your bad breakfast and bread and give you a trinket. But when we talk about conflicts, June is when Father's Day is. June's in the summer months. You got to make sure that your parenting plan says that mom can't pick that weekend of Father's Day as one of her travel weekends because now there's a conflict. Mom gets to pick travel in odd number of years, but she picks Father's Day, but Father's Day is obviously going with dad. So, and I know we're right in the the current holiday season with Thanksgiving and Christmas and Hanukkah and New Year's. And and so we want to give some pointers there. The message is the same, right? Because all of these problems are more easily solved and more easily de-escalated when you're able to look at the calendar ego-free and say, what is the what is the solution here that offers the most love for the kid and gives the kid the most opportunity to share love with the parent as appropriate? Which is spending quality time with you. Yeah. And that's my point about going back and forth. Now, I'm not, look, I've done thousands of parenting plans where they split Christmas. Sure. And I just like say, hey, just think about this. Is this more for you or is it for your kid? And I appreciate that it could be for you. And that is okay. I'm not saying that it's not okay that you want to spend Christmas with your kid, but let's do it without conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Any other tips, hot tips, hot, hot tips, things you absolutely should not do as you go into the holiday season as a co-parent? Don't call your lawyer the night on Christmas Eve. That's we already got that out the door. Yeah. No conflict. No conflict. Whatever is happening is not worth the conflict for your kid. You don't want your kid being in 20 years old, 30 years old, you know, having kids of their own saying, man, I am not going to have conflict during the holidays because I lived through that conflict and I never enjoyed Christmas. Yeah, because my memory is invariably my parents fighting on the front yard. That's right. That is the absolute key. And parents will go crazy if they're not getting their kid. I I hear it. I appreciate it. I appreciate where you're coming from. We can deal with it later. And you can say, you know what? I'm going to celebrate Christmas on the 28th. And I'm going to, I'm going to crush it for that kid. And I get if you didn't get your kid on the 25th when you're supposed to, you don't get him till the 28th. 
you're going to be super pissed. But instead of spending money on your lawyer, I would tell you, save that money and fine, go do extra gift buying, <laughs> right? <laughs> but um, that that's really the key is the least amount of conflict as possible. And one way to do that is to set low expectations. Don't think everything's going to be perfect. Plan that it's going to be Christmas Eve or Christmas Day or you're going to mass and the other parents dropping off the kid and that kid's not going to be bathed or fed or have the proper clothes. Plan ahead. That is the key. You want things to be as smooth as possible so you have less conflict so your kid can really enjoy the holidays. So go enjoy the holidays, everybody. We are on the, we're ready to do that ourselves. And uh, we encourage you to de-escalate, relax, you'll figure it out. And if you can't figure it out for real, Judge Harry Stone has your back. He'll he'll do a parenting plan like in no time. Oh, yeah. Midnight court session. Exactly. Bringing the kid in at midnight. Right. <laughs> he might do midnight mass right there. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Stone is a capable, capable jurist. What? That's is... all I'm saying. Do you think that's even on reruns these days? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Night court. Night court. Of course. Great show. Oh, Great bull, show. Please. Oh, we're gonna, yes. you know what? We should do a whole episode where we do where we cover uh, all of our favorite night court moments. The rulings on night court. <laughs> <laughs> I think wait. I think many of them got appealed to the United States Supreme Court. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Stone's very popular among the uh, among Supreme Court. It's I'm the only sure. thing the justices would agree on is overturning I, that guy. Right. <laughs> what you don't know is RBG had a p- picture of, of Harry Anderson on her wall <laughs> right behind her desk. You didn't know that. You thought it was just all blind justice and scales. But no, Harry Anderson. I gotcha. You got me on that one. You got me on that one. Listen, everybody, have a great holiday. Focus on your kid. Keep it calm. Not a lot of conflict. Try to recharge and and not have it be about all the extra stuff. Focus on the quality time, and that's what your kid will remember. Create those memories, people, but only the good ones. Create the good ones for the holiday season. Uh, Thank you, Seth Nelson. Have a great holiday season yourself. Yeah, I'm kind of subdued today. I'm already kind of in that mood. You are. You're just chilling. You're ready. Just Bring chilling. out the little spiked eggnog. It's going to be great. That's what all the nice Jewish boys like to drink <laughs> on the first night of Hanukkah. <laughs> right next to the Manischewitz. It's great. <laughs> right next to the Manischewitz. That's right. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us. We appreciate your time and attention. Uh, don't forget, you can send your holiday-related questions or otherwise to the show at howtosplittertoaster.com slash question. That'll get to us. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, have a safe holiday season. We'll catch you next time right here on How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. Seth Nelson is an attorney with NLG Divorce and Family Law with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, How to Split a Toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of NLG Divorce and Family Law. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.